Oral questions? The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is for the Premier. The Premier had an entire election campaign to look people in the eye and tell them exactly what he was going to do. But instead of being straight up with the people of Toronto and Peel, York, Niagara and Muskoka, he deliberately kept his plot from millions of voters. Why didn't the Premier tell the people about his secret plan to rip up Toronto's wards and can can cancel regional elections? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we have big issues in this province. We need to fix health care. We need to create jobs. We need to lower higher rates and lower taxes. But clearly, but clearly, the Leader of the Opposition doesn't care about these important issues that matter to the people of Ontario. She only cares about protecting a bunch of politicians' jobs. This is the second day in a row the Leader of the Opposition stood up again saving politicians' jobs. While well, our party is trying to save the taxpayers' money, I'm trying to make a government Response. work for the people, and the opposition is trying to elect more politicians. That's where their priorities are. I just wish Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, people see exactly what this Premier is doing, and they don't like it one bit, Speaker. He's stealing power away from voters, cancelling elections that were already underway, and ripping up Toronto's wards in the middle of a campaign. There was no consultation, no fair process, but the Premier is barging ahead anyways and inflicting his own will on millions of people, millions of voters, Speaker. Why is this Premier treating the people of Ontario with, with such complete and total contempt? For you, Mr. Speaker, as I was saying, I wish the Leader of the Opposition would spend half the amount of time focusing on priorities that matter to the people of Ontario. That matters when it comes to hospital wait times, when they open their hydro bill every single month and see that they have the highest hydro rates, the highest taxes. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, the people of Hamilton did not elect the Leader of the Opposition to protect a bunch of politicians' jobs in Toronto. They elected the Leader of the Opposition to lower their hydro rates like we're doing. We're well on our way to lowering hydro rates by 12 percent. We're well on our way reducing personal income tax by 20 percent. We're well on our way to make sure we have a good governance system and we get the City of Toronto back on track. There's total gridlock at the City of Toronto. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. You know, the people of Ontario can see right through the Premier's bluster speaker, and they don't see a leader, they see a bully. They see a man who is taking petty, vindictive and mean-spirited retaliation against millions of voters, against a city that rejected him, and against his own political opponents. Why is this Premier abusing the powers of his office with the most outrageous anti-democratic action that Ontario has seen in many Many, many, many years. Undertaker seat. Undertaker seat. Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, myself and the Leader of the Opposition, we differ on a few items. Leader of the Opposition believes in big government, more politicians, more politicians, higher taxes high carbon tax, yep. high cap and trade. Yep. We believe in lowering, getting rid of the carbon tax, getting rid of the cap and trade, which we're doing and did. 
We believe in building transit for the great people of Toronto and the GTA. We believe in streamlining the government. I repeat, streamlining the government, making government work for the people, Here. not the people working for the government. That's their philosophy. Yep. We're going to focus on running an efficient government. We're going to focus on respecting the Boss. taxpayers. Here. We're going to focus on putting money back into the taxpayers' pocket. Members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. It's too bad he doesn't believe in democracy, though, Speaker. It's just too bad he doesn't believe in democracy. The people of Toronto should have had the power to decide on how they are represented, who they elect, and what Toronto City Council should look like. No one else should have that decision, Speaker. No one else. It should be up to the people of Toronto. And that's why Council voted yesterday to oppose the Premier's plot to rip up wards in the middle of the campaign. The question is, why exactly is it that this Premier is trying to rig the election and put more power in his own hands? Premier. <laughs> Go ahead, tell me when I'm ready. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker. Again, this is where we differ a little bit. We believe in streamlining the government. We believe in democracy. We believe in representing the people. Democracy is doing what we said we're going to do. We said we're going to reduce the size and cost of government, yep. and that is exactly what we're doing. We're going to make sure we're going to make sure that we get the city of Toronto, the dysfunctional city of Toronto, back on track. Here, here, my friends. I want to congratulate. I want to congratulate the councillors that stood up, 17 of them, for respecting the taxpayers. Here, here. Council Gary Crawford, Vincent Crisanti, Glenda Bearmaker, Justin DiGiano, Frank DiGiorgio, Michael Ford, Mark Grimes, Michelle Holland, Stephen Holliday, Norm Kelly, Giorgio Mammolini, Denzel Minnan-Wong, Francis Nunziata, Cesar Palacio, Jay Robinson, David Shiner, and Michael Thompson. Respect the Start the clock. Supplementary. Well, a little lesson in democracy. That's less than 50 percent, Speaker. That's less than 50 percent. <laughs> Look, what, he de what this Premier has, uh, has not, I, I, I think, uh, acknowledged is what his decision is all about is election rigging. And anybody thinks that he gets to decide how to define a democracy really talks to, speaks to the issue of his belief in, uh, in being a dictator as opposed to— Yeah, but I'm going to again caution the members on intemperate language because it inflames passions and makes it impossible to have decorum in this House. And I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw that comment. Okay. What? What? Withdraw, Speaker. The Premier's secret plot is fundamentally at odds with our democracy. And it is not up to one man to decide how an entire city should be governed. It is not up to one man to decide what Toronto's government should look like, and it is not up to one man to discard years and years of public consultation and impose his own hidden agenda on millions of people. Question. What is it about democracy that this Premier does not get? Through you, Mr. Speaker, I love the fact that politicians and the ones that the Leader of the Opposition are trying to protect. They're trying to protect their little fiefdom. Yep. I, I, can tell you one, I can tell you one thing. Did anyone in this room ever get consulted when they want to increase the politicians? No. The answer is no. So they rammed it through a perfect example of how dysfunctional the city is. You watch it. You watch it yesterday on the news. You could see the dysfunction down there. 
We're going to make sure we run the City of Toronto more efficiently with 25 councillors, as we have 25 MPs, 25 MPPs. As I said the other day, the City of Los Angeles, with 4 million people, have 15 councillors. Imagine that. Imagine less politicians. Imagine respecting the taxpayers. Imagine reducing taxes. I know you don't believe in reducing taxes. Our party believes in respecting the taxes. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members will take your seat. Final supplementary. Restart. Speaker, the Premier's assault on local democracy is all about helping him take revenge on his political opponents and punish the people of Toronto who have rejected him over and over again. Yesterday, Councillor Mamaliti let the mask slip, Speaker, and revealed that this plot is all about purging City Council of progressive councillors. It's all about rigging the election to increase the Premier's control and make sure that right Conservatives take over the city. At least Councillor Mamaliti had the guts to come clean, Speaker. Why doesn't the Premier have the guts to do the same? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I'm looking at my list again, and I'm counting half half the members that are for reducing council are part of the Liberal Party. We even have one of your own, one of your own NDP staunch members voting against you, Leader of Opposition. It's very clear, it's very clear. Again, sorry to interrupt the Premier, but I would again remind all members of the House that you have to make your remarks through the chair. Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's very clear. This isn't about being red orange or blue. It's about respecting the taxpayer. It's about making sure they've been down there for a number of years. They see nothing gets done. Yep. Transit wasn't built under David Miller, wasn't built under Rob Ford, wasn't built under John Tory. It's about time we stop the gridlock in the city and the GTA. Thank you. Stop the clock. Members will please take your seats. Restart the clock. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. Instead of a Premier who does right for what uh, for Ontario does what's right for Ontario, we have a Premier who's focused on settling scores with his own political opponents. The people of Toronto have repeatedly voted against this Premier Speaker, so now he's trying to punish them with a vindictive, vindictive and mean-spirited attack on our local democracy. How can this Premier be willing to attack? the principles of our democracy, the very principles of our democracy, and rig local elections just to get political revenge on the people. Yeah. So, I that out of order, but ask the, the, the member, leaving the opposition again, to withdraw. Withdraw, yeah. Speaker. Premier. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I think the Leader of the Opposition is setting a new record for withdrawing your comments. <laughs> you know? What the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker, should be focusing on is why she was elected. And the reason the Leader of the Opposition should have been elected is to respect the taxpayers, protect the people in Hamilton. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, if I went up, the Hamil uh, up into Hamilton and door knocked, into the leader's opposition area, and make no mistake about it, the leader of the opposition won with large vote. I guarantee you the doors I knock on, do you want more politicians in Toronto, the people of Hamilton? They would say absolutely not. They would say, I want lower taxes. I want to make sure our businesses is thrive. I want to make sure we have lower hydro rates. That's what the people of Hamilton Thank you. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. <laughs> I invite the Premier to my riding. He'll get right out of town, Speaker.
There's one thing that the people of Hamilton do respect, and that is democracy, Speaker. They respect democracy, unlike this Premier. You know, just a month into the office, and this Premier has revealed so much about who he is. He's, his word is worthless. His contempt for voters is on full display. He has no respect for municipal leaders. He's willing to trample on our democracy, and he has abused his own office, the office of the Premier, just to take revenge on his political opponents. Why doesn't this Premier understand the difference between being a leader and being a bully? Through you, Mr. Speaker, again, the Leader of the Opposition start, should start focusing on what matters to the people of Ontario, to start focusing on the great people of Hamilton, the hard-working people of Hamilton, that I went up there and we had rooms full of 500, 600 people packed up in Hamilton. I look forward to visiting the fr my friends in Hamilton to tell them what the Leader of the Opposition believes in. The Leader of the Opposition believes, believes in higher government, bigger government, higher taxes, higher, higher rates. I think the Leader of the Opposition is worried about a couple things. Mike Layton and Joe Cressy. That's what the Leader of the Opposition is. That will be taking the Leader of the Opposition's job in the next little while. will come to order. There's a member waiting to ask a question. The House will come to order. The member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. It is very disheartening to hear the kind of angry, unparliamentary language coming from the opposition that we have heard yesterday as they attacked our plan to create a smaller, more effective Toronto That's City right. Council. Our government is committed to working for the people and ensuring that their own local governments represent their views and work in an efficient and effective manner. Mm -hmm. Despite the official opposition's vicious name-calling, isn't it true that our legislation actually enhances local democracy? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The member, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate the member on being here, elected. Here, here. That's, uh, that my bill is, is near and dear to her heart. Our proposed legislation, Speaker, will not only solve the problem right. of a municipal government that is completely tied up in gridlock, it also addresses the important issue of voter parity. Uh, Councillor Justin DiCiano had some excellent remarks uh, on the subject on Friday, and I want to highlight by quoting him and saying, quote, the writings do not belong to the councillors, they belong to Torontonians. There is a massive improvement. Over a million Torontonians who will now have a fair vote because of the decision made this morning. That's the quote. Response. Speaker, if this if the opposition would stop with the attacks and the drive-by smears and actually look at the legislation, they'd see it's improving local government. Thank you. Members will take their seats. Thank you. You're laughing at that? I used to have a little bit of respect for you. Sorry, 
The member for Essex will come to order. <laughs> Supplementary. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for that answer. I find it hard to believe that the opposition, who pretends to be standing up for democracy, wouldn't support a plan to move closer to voter parity, which helps make sure that every voice exactly. is heard equally and represented as such at City Council. Exactly. We Order. all know that if it were up to the NDP, they would encourage even more members of council under the premise of good governance, when it's really just a matter of bloated governance. Right. One of the original options suggested was 48 wards. That's 14 new councillors, 14 new speeches, over $16 million in taxpayer money over and above the existing council budget. Mm. Can you, to the minister, can you tell us why? That just won't work. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and I want to again thank the uh, the member. Well, I'd, I'd say that you, just like you don't put the fox in charge of the hen house, you don't let a group of politicians decide how many of them should keep their jobs. What we've proposed in the Better Local Government Act is nothing new. For two decades, cutting the size of Toronto Council in half has been discussed. In fact, there's a 2014 poll that found 56 per cent wow. in favour of reducing Council from 44 to 22 seats. But this never goes anywhere because councillors always vote to save themselves. The NDP will have to explain why they're champions of big government instead Bonds. of supporting the leaner, more effective council that we're proposing. All right. Members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question for the Minister of Housing and Municipal Affairs. During the debate of a bill brought by the Liberals, a bill that would establish that the regional chair position for the region of York would no longer be appointed but elected, the now Minister of Housing and Municipal Affairs said, and I quote, I think it speaks to the very core of our democracy. I hope that members will support this legislation and perhaps we can expand it at some point down the road for all regions in the province of Ontario. My question for the minister is simple. What changed? What changed? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, through you to the member, I want to thank you for the question. You know what I think uh, was the biggest change for New Democrats? The fact that we're on this side of the House and they're on that side of the House. That's the big change. I want to talk about the debate told us they that took change. place during the election that just passed. Debate where our Premier and the members on this side of the House talked about committing to reducing the size of government, to respecting the taxpayers of this province. Our government for the people were, was very clear during the election that we were going to make sure that a more effective and a more efficient government at all levels was paramount in, uh, in our message to uh, Ontarians. I, again, Speaker, it should come to no surprise to Ontarians that members on that side of the House are going to stand up for big government, Spons. members on this side of the House are going to stand up for effective Better government. and efficient smaller government. Off the call. Members will take their seats. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. So principle means that when you have power, it's irrelevant, That's right? It. Principle goes out the window. My question again for the minister. This makes it all the more likely that the Minister of Municipal Affairs who will be forever associated with this anti-democratic legislation, forever, was as in the dark as the rest of us when it was coming down the pike. My question, when was the minister made aware of the Premier's unilateral decision to cut the number of councillors in Toronto? When? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Speaker, and again, thank you for the question. The very first time I spoke to our Premier, 
after he was selected leader, he came to my riding and he made it crystal clear that putting the taxpayers' dollars, respect, Speaker, respect for taxpayers' dollars was the number one thing that was going to guide him, guide our members, and guide the campaign. Again, it's no surprise to Ontarians that New Democrats continue to stand up for bigger government, more politicians. That's where they stand. We, we've made it very clear, Speaker. We've made it very clear time and time again effective and efficient government, government that can be more streamlined, that can make those quick, effective decisions. We're going to choose that style of government every time. I like that. Restart the clock. Next question. The member for Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Some Toronto City Councillors are calling for a referendum on our plan for a smaller, more cost-effective council. I know you have said a 25-member council will save taxpayers $25 million over the four-year term. We also know that reducing the size of council is going to ensure important decisions on building transit and housing are made faster. This means that the people of Toronto will get the better local government they deserve. But I'm concerned. No one is considering what a referendum will actually cost. Minister, Question. can you provide the House with details? Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member for Mississauga East Cooksville for the question. It's a great question. Order. You're absolutely right, Speaker, through you, that we haven't heard anything about the cost of a referendum, which has to be part of the discussion if you're going to respect taxpayers. We know that in 2012, city staff indicated a special referendum was cost as much as an election, or about $7 million. For comparison, in 2014, Toronto's election cost $8.3 million. Here's a question I'd like to ask taxpayers. Would they rather spend seven to eight million dollars on a referendum asking if you should keep more politicians, or would you rather save 25 million and save that money on politicians? You know something, Speaker? I know. I think I know the answer to I that question. Yes, yes, yes. Supplementary. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your response and for letting taxpayers know the truth about the cost of a referendum. Hearing those numbers, I'm sure taxpayers would rather have their councillors at City Hall taking actions to improve life for every. The House will come to order. The Leader of the Opposition and the Premier will come to order. The Leader of the Opposition and the Premier will come to order. The Leader of the Opposition and the Premier will come to order. I was listening to the, the Leader of the Opposition and the Premier will come to order. Recess. I'm going to recess the House for five
Members can take their seats. Before we resume the question period, I wish to uh, explain to the House what, what just happened, as far as I know. A member from Mississauga East Cooksville was in the midst of a supplementary question. I was listening to it intently. Apparently, something may have been said which caused grave disorder, such that the Speaker felt it was necessary to recess the House. I didn't hear it, any of the comments that apparently were made or may, may, may or may not have been made, but I would ask the members if there are any members that would like to uh, withdraw any unparliamentary comment. I would appreciate their willingness to do so. All right. I would ask the House for order for the remainder of the question period. The member for Mississauga East Thank you, Minister, for your response and for letting taxpayers know the truth about the cost of a referendum. Hearing those numbers, I'm sure taxpayers would rather have their councillors at City Hall taking actions to improve life for everyday residents of Toronto than wasting time and money on a costly referendum, keeping more politicians on the payroll. Frankly, this debate is part of the reason we need these reforms. Looking beyond the cost without a referendum, what gives you the confidence to say our legislation is something the people support? Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And again, through you, I want to thank uh, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville for all of your advocacy and all your efforts. You're a, a real class actor. <laughs> Speaker. No one has a better feel for the pulse of taxpayers in this city or our province than Premier Doug Ford. We heard Speaker loud and clear from voters during the recent provincial election that they want governments at all levels, and I want to stress that, at all levels, to work for them, to work for the people. There's no better referendum, Speaker, than the election we just went through. One that sent us here with a majority and a mandate to reduce the size and cost of government. We talked to tens of thousands of people, Speaker, tens of thousands of people who wanted us to take action, quick action, after the election. That's what the Better Local Government Act does for the people of Toronto Thanks. and for the regions of York, Peel, Niagara, and Muskoka. That's what it does. Restart the clock. The member for University of Rosedale. My question is for the Premier. Why is the Premier only interested in proper public consultation when it serves his far right extremist friends who want to drag Ontario's health curriculum back to 1998? For the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Of government services. Thank you, uh, Speaker. In my capacity as uh, government house leader, uh, we will be uh, standing on standing order uh, 37H. Uh, we will not be answering any questions from the official opposition until we get some kind of an apology from the member opposite who made those comments. We will no longer be answering questions from the official opposition today. Supplementary question. This Premier has rallied on and on about the significance of public engagement, yet he refuses to let the people of Toronto make their own decision about their government. It's clear that his word means very little. He wants it when he wants to roll back the Ontario health education curriculum, but he skips it when the results could threaten his ego. If public engagement is so important to this Premier, then why is he trampling over the people of Toronto and forcing this change on them with no input whatsoever? Minister. 
Speaker, the members opposite can continue to ask questions of our government, but until we get some kind of formal apology, as is our right under Standing Order 37H, which says a minister may, in his or her discretion, decline to answer questions, the government will not be answering any questions from the official opposition here this morning. There's a simple solution to this problem. Everybody makes mistakes, Mr. Speaker. All we're expecting is an apology for the member of this side of the House who asked a question earlier in question period, and we will not be answering any further questions from the members of the official opposition until that happens. Restart the clock. The member for Orléans. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Premier. L'immigration francophone. Francophone immigration is essential. The vitality and prosperity of Franco-Ontarian is also very important. That being said, your government is not working in partnership with Immigration Canada. Eliminated the position of Minister of Franco Francophony after being told several times that to invest more in Francophony was not a priority. Est-ce que le Premier ministre Will the Premier explain to us, in simple terms, what his government will do to target this very important Premier. issue? Minister for, uh, responsible for Immigration. Minister responsible for Immigration. Premier for the opportunity to respond. I'll have uh, my colleague, the Minister responsible for Francophone Affairs, to address you in the, uh, the supplemental. But Ontario has set a target of 5 per cent Francophone immigration, and we've implemented a number of initiatives to increase the number of Francophones in the province, including the Ontario Express Entry French-speaking skilled worker stream, which is an immigration pathway for uh, potential French-speaking immigrants that have skills to succeed in our labour market. My ministry also funds a municipal Francophone immigration web portal, which is dedicated to prof profiling immigration opportunities in the uh, province's Francophone communities. But most of all, Ontario will continue to undertake a variety of international outreach and promotion initiatives in order to reach the Francophone audi audiences worldwide. And I can speak on behalf of uh, this government that myself and the Minister of Francophone Affairs have spoken about this uh, several times since being elected as seatmates, uh, and we intend to uh, undertake more initiatives uh, throughout the rest of the, of the uh, world. Thanks. Supplementary. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, there are many reasons to believe that this government seems to be concrete and keep its um, francophony in, in implication. However, there is a question regarding the international, what's brought internationally, but all programs that have been exi in existence for francophony. My question is yes or no. Will you keep our commitment with the international francophony organization, which could help? towards this 5% target? And will the new government also commit to keep the program to have information, francophone information? Thank you very much. Minister. The minister responsible for francophone affairs. The minister responsible for francophone affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The government keeps its commitment to, towards francophone immigration. As mentioned, the report by the francophone commissioner, the French services commissioner, told us that there is a decrease in the francophone demographic, and if we don't keep working at it, it will keep decreasing. Our government recognizes the, what francophones brings to this province, and we want to keep it for future generations. And this is why, as minister responsible for francophone affairs, I will work with my co-worker, the minister responsible for immigration, to put in place strategies to encourage francophone immigration and to help the francophone community flourish. Next question, the member from Mississauga Center. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister, I watched with interest Ontario government's launch of Human Trafficking Awareness Week. I was pleased to see that you took the time to record a video and speak about your commitment to ending human trafficking. It is also my understanding that your ministry has launched a multi-platform social media campaign to raise awareness of this terrible crime. I applaud your stance and dedication and stand with you against human trafficking. Minister. 
Could you tell this House about our government's commitment to raising awareness and combating human trafficking? Good question. Mr. Speaker, as the minister also responsible for women in this house, I thank the member from Mississauga for her question and for her dedication to ending uh, human trafficking um, in the province of Ontario. I would be remiss if I did not point out the excellent work of my colleague and friend, the Minister of Labour, who has been um, one of the strongest advocates in this assembly, but throughout all of Canada, Canada in trying to end human, tra tra uh, human trafficking. As a result, Ontario has passed legislation because of the, um, of the Minister of Labour to allow individuals to apply for restraining orders against human traffickers. It make it, make it easier for victims of human trafficking to get compensation from those who have trafficked them. And we proclaimed February 22nd of each year as Human Trafficking Awareness Day. And of course, yesterday uh, was a day to remember uh, the, world, the World Day against trafficking in person. So I appreciate, uh, and I'll have more to say in the supplemental, but this is an important issue that every member of this assembly should stand against. Supplementary. Thank you very much for your answer. Back to the minister. I appreciate your focus and our party's long-standing commitment to this issue. Yesterday, I saw your message on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I am glad that we are reaching out to different audiences and on multiple platforms. I was troubled to learn that it is largely our neighbors, friends, and family that are getting caught up in this terrible crime, and that girls as young as 13 are being abused this way. Minister, what is your plan in addition to the social media campaign to create awareness with different audiences, and what is your ministry doing to combat this crime? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, through you. Uh, again, just to, to build on the work that my colleague Lori Scott has done with the Girl Next Door Act uh, in really taking this uh, protection of women and, and, women and girls uh, to the next level, it's important to note that two-thirds of police-reported cases of human trafficking in Canada take place in our province, and they are literally the girls next door. Women and girls are disproportionately represented in victims of human trafficking, and we're going to continue to work in my ministry with community organization, police forces, international partners, and government ministries. Uh, to try and solve this crisis. Uh, through human trafficking, um, it, it is an offence under the Criminal Code of Canada, but provinces are taking action, and I will continue to work with my ministerial colleagues in order to make sure that there is greater enforcement when these issues arise. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member from Niagara Centre. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. This year, for the first time ever, the people of Niagara were going to be able to elect their Niagara Regional Chair. But since the Premier has started cooking up backroom deals with his friends to meddle in municipal elections, he has removed their democratic power. As the Minister should know, people in Niagara have serious concerns about their regional representatives. The Ombudsman and the Auditor General have both been involved with investigations of their activities, and another complaint has been filed recently. Now more than ever, Niagara residents are looking to bring more democracy and accountability to our regional council. Will the minister show some leadership, reverse his short-sighted decision, and allow the people of Niagara to elect their regional chair? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. To the government house leader. Government house leader. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, we will not be, as I said earlier, answering any questions from the official opposition until we get an apology on behalf of the member of Mississauga, East Cooksville. Uh, there was mockery that occurred during question period, and our right under Standing Order 37H is, as a minister, we may, in our discretion, decline to answer any questions in this House. We should be very proud of the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. He arrived here. He arrived at the clock. He, he arrived here in Pakistan in 2004. He had a very, very successful career with BlackBerry, and in less than 15 years of living here in Ontario, he's a member of provincial parliament at Queen's Park in our legislature. He deserves to be treated better than the mockery that went on this morning during question period. Start the clock. Supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, people in Niagara are outraged by this decision. They're tired of the lack of transparency and accountability at the Niagara region. The action taken by this government is a slap in the face to the people of Niagara. Just in the last few weeks, the Niagara Regional Chair tried to influence an ombudsman's investigation by using outside counsel. Mr. Speaker, cancelling the election of the chair will only allow these problems to persist. Does the minister intend to prop up unelected, unaccountable politicians, or will he reverse this decision and give the power back to the people to elect their regional chair? Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I'll cite Standing Order 37H, and we will be refusing to answer any questions from the official opposition until they actually apologize for what occurred here earlier in question period. It was completely unacceptable. It was very audible by members of the government and other members who are here at Queen's Park this morning to observe question period. And until the member responsible apologizes for mocking our member from Mississauga East Cooksville, we won't be answering any questions from the official opposition. Restart the clock. Mr. Speaker, take a look at this government caucus. We have the member from Mississauga East Cooksville who came from Pakistan. We have the first Tamil member elected in this legislature. We have a very, very diverse group of politicians representing our Thank you. Thank you. The member for Flamborough Glenbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is directed to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Now, this weekend, athletes, coaches, and spectators will experience the Ontario Summer Games in the beautiful city of London, Ontario. In fact, my riding of Flamborough Glenbrook will be sending athletes from ages 12 to 18. Many people in my riding are excited about this and they want to learn more about this unique program that is overseen by your ministry. Can the minister tell the House more about the Ontario Games program? Thank you for that question. You, you are absolutely right. The London 2018 Ontario Summer Games is supported by our government through the Games Ontario program. This program supports events like the Ontario Summer Games, the Winter Games for Youth, and the Ontario 50 Plus Summer and Winter Games for Seniors, as well as the Ontario Parasport Games for people with disabilities. The games run from August 2nd through to the 5th with over 3,300 athletes, coaches, and officials in 21 sports. The games are supported by over 800 volunteers from the local community and the surrounding area. The Games Organizing Committee has spent 18 to 24 months to plan and deliver these games. These games are crucial in developing the talents of young athletes. Notable alumni of the games include Diana Matheson of the National Women's Soccer Team and Aaron Brown, a member of the men's relay team who captured a bronze medal at the 2016 Olympic Games in Rio. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the insight into this initiative. You know, I'm really happy that our government for the people is able to make investments in young athletes and our communities that will bring a positive change that will be felt for years to come. Minister, can you elaborate on how the Games are benefits to both our athletes and to our communities? Good question. 
Thank you to the member for Niagara Flambrook. I wish your uh, team members well, but of course I'm cheering for all of Ontario. <laughs> Through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member for their insight into the Games Ontario program. I'm glad that we were able to shed some light on how important this program is. The games are a valuable motivator to encourage young people to be active and competitive in sports. The games deliver a valuable experience developing Ontario's athletes. This year's Ontario Summer Games are expected to generate economic impact of $6 million in London. As part of the game's legacy, 10 new beach volleyball courts will be added to the North London Athletics Field. These additional courts, the Ontario Volleyball Association, will now be able to run beach volleyball programs in the city. This is one of the many ways that our government is supporting local communities and sport, increasing economic activity in our province. I encourage all members in the House to support their local participants in the Games in the, from their Bonds. riding in any way. Thank you. Next question, Member for Timmins. My question is to the Premier. Does the Premier believe he can cancel question period just because he doesn't like the questions? Consumer Services. Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Speaker. In uh, my capacity as government house leader, I'm uh, taking this question. There was a very, very audible comment that came from the member who just asked that question during question period. It was mocking the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. If the member opposite the House Leader for the Official Opposition wants question period to continue. The honourable thing to do would be to stand in his place and apologize for making those comments and mocking the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Start the clock. Mr. Mr. Speaker. Many members on this government side clearly heard the mocking remarks that were made. We are a very proud government caucus over here of our diversity. A simple mistake was made. A mistake was made, Mr. Speaker. There's a simple solution to this. Stand in your place in the supplementary and apologize to the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Before I ask for the supplementary, I wish to inform the House that you can see that I'm wearing this earpiece. I have the volume cranked full blast because otherwise I can't hear the person who has the floor on, on many exchanges. That's because of the loud voices uh, that er it seems that everyone in the House is, is participating. I can't hear everything that's said in the House. The government House Leader says there was an audible comment. I did not hear it. Supplementary. November for Timmins. Premier, uh, I'm being accused of something, and if people know me and heard me in this House for 28 years and my constituents, that is not who I am and that's not what I say. I don't use that language. So my question is back to the Premier. Does the Premier believe in parliamentary democracy and the right of the opposition to ask questions to the government, yes or no? Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned off the top, uh, after that mocking remark was made in this legislature, we'll be invoking Standing Order 37H. We will not be answering any questions from the members of the official opposition until the member opposite apologizes for those comments that was made. I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that one thing we do have on this side of the House is respect for this institution. We have respect for this institution. We have respect for all members. We have respect Order. for all members of this Order. legislature, all 124 members of this legislature. We will not be mocking the members like the member of the official opposition did. We'll be standing up for the members of this legislature. It's all about respect, and we saw a lack of respect this morning during question period. But
restart the clock. Next question, the member for Niagara, Niagara West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. During the summer months, people from my riding and many other ridings across the province enjoy spending time camping with friends or discovering new parts of Ontario while taking the family on a road trip. And These used to be relatively easy and, more importantly, affordable ways uh, for average families to get a break without costing them a fortune. Unfortunately, Speaker, instead of getting a break, these trips are now leaving families broke. The soaring cost of fuel has families looking to this government for relief. This past week, the Minister of the Environment tabled legislation that will put an end to the cap and trade carbon tax. Can the Minister of the Environment please explain to this House how our government's plan will make life more affordable for families across Ontario? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the uh, member, and thank you to the member from uh, Niagara West for that question. And of course, over 10 million people do visit Ontario's parks during the uh, during the summer, so it is a popular pastime. But it is a pastime that requires people to drive their cars. Uh, speaker, we've been clear that we are going to be staying true to the promise we made to the people of Ontario. The Cap and Trade Cancellation Act will deliver real savings for families, $260 per year every year. It's estimated the cost of gasoline will be reduced by 4.5 cents per litre, the cost of diesel by 5.5 within the year if this legislation is passed. Mr. Speaker, on the other side, we've asked the question before, and of course they have uh, other things to worry about today, but we've asked the question, how high a carbon tax would they support? Uh, the member from Ottawa Centre says he wants the highest carbon tax in the world, wow. 35 cents. The member from Hamilton West, Ant the member from Hamilton West Ancaster the member from Hamilton West Ancaster calls our policy of lower gas taxes reckless. Supplementary. Thank you for uh, your illuminating response, Minister. The truth is we've seen this story play out before. A Liberal Prime Minister paired with an NDP Premier. It's truly a dangerous combination. In British Columbia, the federal Liberal carbon plan paired with the NDP's uh, carbon tax has seen gas prices skyrocket to more than $1.60 per litre in April. This is the highest gas prices in North America. And Mr. Speaker, they can say what they want, but a tax is a tax is a tax. Ontario simply cannot afford to pay for these Liberal policies. Every time the NDP advocates for higher gas prices, they demonstrate just how out of touch they are with the realities that families in Ontario face. Will the Minister of the Environment advise this House as to the dangers of the NDP's carbon tax plan? Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. The people of Ontario can't afford historically high gas prices. That's why we're proceeding with our plan that will reduce the price of fuel. The end of the carbon tax means relief for families, it means relief for businesses, and more disposable income for households. We understand the realities that families face when they wait in line, sometimes for hours, to save a couple of cents at the pump. It's ironic, Mr. Speaker, that the member from Timmins, in a, in a piece of his own legislation, claims he wants to protect consumers from gouging at the pumps, and yet his party sits idly by while this side and this government brings forward legislation that will actually support families and have real reductions at the pumps. The era of the carbon tax is over in Ontario. We will bring relief for families. Thank you. The member for Timiskaming Park. Thank you. Last week, we said the Premier was behaving as though he thought he was the King of Ontario. To the Premier. So far, he's rammed bills through the House without consultation or committee hearings. He's interfering in democratic elections across Ontario. Will the Premier do the right thing and respect Ontario's democracy and democratic institutions? Premier of Government and Consumer Service. Thanks. Uh, Speaker, and uh, thanks to the member opposite for the question, which we won't be answering uh, here this morning. Uh, we'll be invoking Standing Order uh, 37H again, which I will remind uh, the members uh, gives the minister the opportunity to decline to answer a question. And the reason that we're doing that, Mr. Speaker, is because a member of our government caucus, who we are very proud to have as a member of our government caucus from Mississauga East Cooksville, was mocked during question period by a member of the official opposition. It was disrespectful to stay, say the least, Mr. Speaker. We could resume question period and the NDP could ask questions and get answers from the government members if they did the simple step of standing in their place 
and apologizing for the remark that was made during question period earlier. When you make a mistake, apologize. Apologize. Supplementary. So again to the Premier. The Premier has cancelled contracts, cancelled due process, cancelled consultation, cancelled cap and trade, and now he's cancelling question period. Is the Premier for real or just trying to change the channel? That's right. Mr. Speaker, we could easily resume question period and answer the questions from the members of the official opposition if the House Leader on the opposite side would stand in his place and apologize to the member from Mississauga East Cookville. Here, here. A member of our legislature, a member of our government caucus, a proud Pakistani Canadian who's been in this country for 15 years. Look at the diversity of this government caucus, Mr. Speaker. We have the first Tamil Canadians elected to the legislature, the first Korean Canadian MPP, the Minister for Seniors in this legislature, the first Coptic Egyptian Canadian MPP, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills, we're proud to have, the first Armenian Canadian MPP, Babikian, from the other side as well. We we have two Persian Canadian MPPs, three Chinese Canadian MPPs, one Hindu Canadian Spons. MPP, four Sikh Canadian MPPs, and three Jewish MPPs, Mr. Speaker. We are very proud of this caucus, and we will celebrate. Members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. I would like to begin by congratulating the minister for being tasked with the crucial responsibility of being responsible for overseeing the province's correctional system, including its many dedicated correctional officers and staff. Mr. Speaker, for the past 15 years, our correctional system, its many dedicated and hardworking correctional staff were repeatedly neglected. As a member of this government for the people, I am honoured to stand here today knowing that our government is committed to fixing the crisis in our correctional system caused by the previous Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please explain what he is doing to address the current crisis in the Ontario correctional system? Thank you. Mr. Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that uh, question to our member from Oakville. Uh, congratulations on your election, and uh, thanks again for the question. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the previous Liberal government left our correctional services in a crisis. I'm proud to state here today that our government for the people will remain committed to our promise of hiring more correctional, probation, and parole officers to end the current crisis in corrections. This past Friday, Mr. Speaker, I attended the Correctional Officer and Training Assessment graduation in Hamilton, where we graduated more than 182 men and women to become correctional officers, and that they are being deployed as of Monday of this week. Mr. Speaker, our frontline correctional workers know that they finally have a government who will listen to them and deliver on a promise of ending the crisis in corrections. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the minister, uh, thank you very much for your update and the work you're doing to address the crisis in Ontario's correctional system. I am proud to see our government working for the people, respecting our frontline workers and acknowledging the hard work they, ever do. they do every day. Mr. Speaker, it is also my understanding that the minister participated in a ride-along with members of the Hamilton Police Force this past weekend. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please give an update on the members of this legislature on what he learned from this experience? Thank you. Minister. Thank you again for the question. Uh, this past Friday, Mr. Speaker, I also participated in a ride-along in Hamilton with the Hamilton Police Crisis Response Unit, which consists of the Crisis Outreach and Support Team, the Mobile Rapid Response Team, and the Social Navigator Program. These teams of men and women work together to ensure public safety through addressing the root causes of crime and by participating in crisis prevention training.
The mental health training aspect of this unit is just one of the many policing innovations here in Ontario being led by our police services. Unlike those from the official opposition, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to respect our police and correctional services and will remain committed to providing our first responders with the resources they require to perform their jobs. The status quo failed, Mr. Speaker, and we're the only party in this House that is prepared to do something about it. We have made a Box. promise and we intend to keep it. Here, here, here. Next question. Next question, member for Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. So far, we've heard that the Premier doesn't need to consult Ontarians because he knows better than them. Consultations are at the heart of democracy. We heard that the Premier is cancelling question period. Why does it feel like the Premier believes he is above Ontario's democracy? Order. Premier. Government and Consumer Services. Thanks, uh, Speaker. And I don't know about you, but uh, we're here in question period. Uh, the only questions that we're not answering, Mr. Speaker, with all due respect to the member from Nickel Belt, who uh, has had her question basically null and made null and void by the fact that another member of her caucus uh, mocked a member of our caucus earlier during question period, Mr. Speaker, and there would be a simple resolution to this standoff, Mr. Speaker, if the member responsible would stand in his place and simply apologize to the member from Mississauga East Cooksville. He is a very well-respected member, obviously, in his community, a proud Pakistani-Canadian who arrived in Ontario 14 years ago to raise his family, to make a living. He's been a contributing member both in the business world and here in our legislature, and we are very proud of that member. I'd like to go back to the Premier Speaker. This Premier makes his decision in back rooms. He seems to think that he knows more about Toronto democracy than the people of Toronto themselves. Now he is cancelling question period, something that goes back to Confederation itself. Order. Does the Premier believe that he is above Ontario's democracy? Who is above apologizing? Mr. Speaker. <laughs> It's amazing to me to hear members on the opposite side say we're cancelling question period when question period has now gone on for 59 minutes and 30 seconds, Mr. Speaker. What we're choosing not to do is respond to questions from the official opposition because they are mocking a member of our government caucus, a very proud Pakistani Canadian who represents his community extremely well. Any member of our Ontario population, no matter where they came to Ontario from, has the opportunity to represent their community in this legislature, just as Mr. Khalid Rashid is doing right here, here in Mississauga. Thank you. Thank you. Order. Order. I recognize the member for Timmins on a point. Well, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just want to say, uh, in regards to the standing orders, it is clear according to Standing Order uh, 23H and I, you can't make allegations against another member, which they are doing now, and impuse, impute, impute false and unavowed motives to another member. And clearly, that's what they're doing. You know me. I've been in this legislature as long as you. That's not who I am. I understand all about accents. Je suis francophone. I am a francophone, and I have an accent, and uh, a lot of people have mocked my accent. The House knows that, and it's just, a, to me, a very offensive thing for the government to try to change channels on question period to answering questions about something I never did.
Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Orléans has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Children, Community, Sa Community and Social Services concerning support for a Francophone Community Grants Program. This matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. This House is in recess until 3 o'clock this afternoon.